three, one, two, three, did this say? All right, hi, welcome everyone. I'm glad you guys are here for session three of the Covenant of Grace. We're covering Romans today. I'm so fired up. I tell you what, I like to say this whenever I'm teaching or preaching is, I can promise you one thing. One of us is going to have a great time, at least. I know the rest of you will too, but I get so fired up and I've learned so much. I was just telling some people here um, how much I learned just preparing for these things. So I'm really excited about this. It's full of life. I'll, I'll even use the phrase I mentioned a minute ago uh, before the camera started that um, uh, I started the study out years and years ago, uh, and I called it Law versus Grace. And I spent hundreds of hours studying scripture on this topic. And, uh, uh, but I'm changing it now to be more life-giving, and that's going to be a covenant of grace and we're looking at, uh, the first session was Galatians, second uh, session was uh, Hebrews, and this one is going to be about Romans. Now, trust me, there's, I've got over 200 verses on this. In fact, I probably could pull out 300 or more verses in Scripture to talk about this subject. We're going to, and then Romans itself, I could have easily 60 Scriptures, but I wanted to, uh, to pare it down so that we are actually probably going to look at only about 20 actually in the context of the book of Romans. Um, because I want to make sure we focus on some of the real important parts and have time to summarize what we had talked about the first two sessions and bring it back to a practical application. For those of you who I forgot to announce myself to, I'm Scott Olson, and uh, we, uh, so we, I'm here at Oasis Church. I love it here. It's a great family. You got to try it. If you're online watching this, come on and try out this church, all right? We are great. All right, so let me summarize a, a, a little bit of the previous weeks. Um, well, first, actually, I'm going to, the little introduction here, we will have scripture coming up on the screen yet for this, but uh, Hebrews 5.13, it's basically talking about baby believers versus mature believers, and it says the mature believers have learned to walk in righteousness, so that's a key factor, and we're going to be hitting that up so many times that uh, um, it's going to be bouncing in your head all night long and tomorrow on the next day. Um, <clears throat> but mature believers have actually learned how to handle and correctly the idea of righteousness. All right? if, and it says if you don't, you're, you're considered a not mature believer, a babe. All right? Not, nothing wrong with being a babe Christian as long as you don't stay there. So it's, it's a moving forward towards maturity. Uh, now, the very next, that was Hebrews 5.13. The very next verse, Hebrews 6.1, is an admonition or an exhortation that says, repent from dead works and then turn towards faith towards God. So dead works is actually this whole idea that we're going to talk about. So um, very pertinent here. It's a, very, it's a foundational principle, it says in Romans 6.1, to be able to, to walk in righteousness. Then I'm going to mention... Uh, Ephesians 4.14, this also talks about mature believers. And it says a mature believer, uh, because of their maturity, it prevents them from believing false doctrine, being led astray, or being shaken. You know how many Christians have their faith shaken? They have their life shaken? Maybe it's only for a day or two, but it could be for weeks and months and years. So the idea here is that when you have maturity, you won't have your faith shaken and you won't be susceptible to believing false doctrine and being led astray. Now, the last one I'm going to mention here as an introduction is 1 Corinthians 15, 56. That says, simply put, that the law empowers sin. So when we try to follow law in our life, it actually robs us of so much life from God that it empowers sin to operate. Seems contradictory, right? But it is, it is actually right there in Scripture. So let's move on to, to the actual start of it all, all right? Oh, and that won't be it. It's this page right here. All right. Starting, I'm going to, like I said, I pared this down from about probably about 60 verses down to about 20, okay? So I'm going to try and fill in some of the gap here. But uh, we're going to start right in chapter 3, and that's going to be uh, verse uh, 19, Romans 3. 319. And I'm going to try and do some reading, even though it's going to be up in the monitors. I'm going to try and uh, face you more and uh, read it from, right from my tablet. I got a little squinting, having to, I have to do squinting because I've got my contacts in here, which means I need readers. All right. Now, 
we realize that everything the law says, it addresses to those who are under its authority. This is for two reasons, so they, the, that every excuse will be silenced with no boasting of innocence. Right, so the law is, we got to make sure we define what the law is, by the way. We did this in some previous sessions, but there's two kinds of law here. One of them is the law of Moses, or the Mosaic Covenant, or known as Torah. is a, another way to describe it, although Torah has a bigger meaning to mean just the coaching and instruction of the Lord. But oftentimes when it's referred to as Torah, it's referring to the 613 commandments. And you'll find out, by the way, in Scripture that uh, if you don't follow all 613 all the time, 100% of your life, you failed at all of them. Okay, so you have missed the mark. So that is a hopeless, hopeless endeavor. But the law addresses to those who are under its authority. And we're going to find out that we are no longer under its authority. All right, so let's go to verse 20, right next door to it. For by the merit of observing the law, no one earns the status of being declared righteous before God. Let's see, now my tablet might have an older version of the Passion Translation, but let's see. For by the merit of observing the law, no one earns the status of being declared righteous before God. Yeah. So how many people does it say? None. No one. I always, I always liked it when uh, someone was uh, trying to help us make a point. He goes, all? What does all mean? All means all, and none means none. So nobody, there's, well, there is one exception. His name is Yeshua, Jesus. He was able to fulfill the law. So by merit, just notice that. Oh, yeah, so I didn't cover the second uh, version of the law. The, the Torah and the, the Mosaic Covenant was one. We also make up our own law. Or well, maybe it's the church that we went to. You must do this, you must do that. And if you don't do this, God's going to turn his back on you. And da, 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 da. You may have a relationship with God, but you don't actually have fellowship and da, 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 all that stuff. You're going to find out that that is, I'm editing some not so nice words in my head right now. So I'll just stay with that is not correct. <laughs> okay, Hogwash was the nicest one I could think of. That is not true. But they, they presented it in, with such scriptural authority or some authority but outside of scripture that we just believe in. And we hear it often, so often that we start to actually believe that which is repeated to us. All right, so uh, verse 20, I'll say it again. For by the merit of observing the law, no one earns the status of being declared righteous before God. It is the law that fully exposes and unmasks the reality of sin. So the purpose of the law was to actually expose our ability to not be able to do it. That's actually, it's actually pretty cool to hear think of it that way, but it's actually not how I was raised. I was thinking of a whole different story there. All right, let's go to uh, verse 21. We're just going to, oh, and this one here, because of the passion, uh, sometimes puts two verses into one. Uh, we'll see all, we'll see two verses here. Um, but now, independently of the law, so remember, we've just heard that the law can't be observed, followed ourselves. We can't obey it enough to make it any difference in our life for righteousness. But now, independent of the law, the righteousness of God is tangible and brought to light through Jesus, the anointed one. This is the righteousness that the scriptures prophesied would come. All right, so I'm, I'm putting this verse in this grouping here because it says this was prophesied of. This is not a new New Testament thing. It's not just a New Testament thing. This was prophesied by the prophets of old. So, we, in fact, even people like David talked about it. Um, God spoke about it uh, to Adam and Eve. God spoke to uh, Abraham about it. This is the righteousness of God. It's in all over the Old Testament also. So this is not a new and divergent, divergent topic. All right, let's go to uh, verse uh, 24. Four, in the same chapter, chapter 3. Where is, I got a slide, the right spot, there we go. Yet through his powerful declaration of acquittal, God freely gives away his righteousness, his gift, or his righteousness, his gift of love and favor now cascades over us all because Jesus, the anointed one, has liberated us from the guilt, punishment, and power of sin. That's a packed verse, all right? Let's go through that one a little bit, so part of it. Piece by piece. Through his powerful declaration of acquittal. You know, acquittal is a legal term, right? 
If you're being tried for something and you're in court and things happen that the judge says not guilty or dismissed actually is what an acquittal really is. You, know, you don't even have to go through trial because you're, it's been dismissed. So the trial against us, the issue of sin, has been acquitted is what it says here. God has said, I'm throwing it out of court, not even going to trial. And here God says he freely gives away his righteousness. Freely. How much does it cost when you get something for free? I mean, sometimes, you know, something's like, well, here's a free gift, and it'll only cost you $19.99 with the other pre No, that's not free. I mean, if you have to buy something, and then another thing is free, eh, that's not what God's talking about here. A free gift means that there is no cost whatsoever. You just have to open your hand and receive it. So God freely gives away his righteousness. His righteousness, by the way. I mean, almost every other word is, is worth pouncing on. His righteousness, not mine. I have none. <laughs> the righteousness that I have now is all because of Jesus and because God declared it. Well, then it says uh, his gift of love and favor. Look at the language here. His gift of love and favor cascades over us. Wow, cascades. Now I'm picturing out here there's a place called Mount Noma Falls. It's a several hour drive on the way to Portland. But it is hundreds of feet of water cascading down on one level and then another level. It's impressive and powerful. You can feel the, the ground uh, vibrating from this power. That's what I'm picturing here. That his love and favor, he's actually in favor of you. He's trying to bring good things to you. He's not a killjoy. Those things cascade over us. Because of Jesus, the anointed one, has liberated us from, oh, look at this. So there's even more. He's liberated, liberated us from guilt, from punishment, and the power of sin. So here's a point to, to keep in mind. If you feel like there's something wrong with you and God is not in favor of you, if you think that there's a barrier between you and God, it's not God. It's you. You have placed the guilt in front between the two of you. Well, that means you can be easily removed in a way, logically speaking, right? Uh, because you put it there, you can remove it. God's done everything he can to actually remove that, that guilt. It's already done for him. In fact, he sees us so perfect. He sees us just like Jesus. So if you're feeling a, a barrier between you, um, if you feel like God's going to punish you, well, there's some other verses we're going to look at that talks about his wrath. And right in line with this, there is no punishment. God is not up, up there, wherever. He's actually in here, right? He's around here. But just, you know, because we're used to saying up there. He's not up there with a bat waiting to go, bam. Not if you got Jesus in your life. Not if you got the righteousness of Jesus. He's not going to be mel uh, dealing out punishment. And look at this. The concept of righteousness affects the power of sin over our life. Do, if, have you struggled with some area, either short-term or all your life? Like, how do I get over this? Well, righteousness is actually the key because the power of sin has been broken by it. All right, let's see. i got to catch up to where I think where I am. That's still in chapter 3, aren't we? Let's go to verse 28. All right. 26, 7... There we go, 28. Okay, so Paul, here we are. Uh, well, there's uh, like 13, 14 chapters in Romans. I actually should know this, but I don't. But it's in the teens. And he's in chapter 3 going, here's the conclusion. Oh, I mean, he already laid. So it's like a good lawyer uh, going before the jury and saying, here's what we're going to prove. This and this and this and this. By the way, I, I should have mentioned this earlier. Romans is a legal book. It's a document. Other books of the Bible have less of this legal flavor to it. Uh, sometimes people think it's a hard book to read for that, but if you have the mindset of a defense attorney or a prosecuting attorney, you can kind of get a feel for what's going on here. So he lays out before the jury, which is, he's trying to get us to believe this, he says, um, we're going to prove this, and here's what he's going to prove. Verse 28, he says, and I lost, okay, there we go, uh, so, our conclusion is this. 
God's wonderful declaration that we are righteous in his eyes can only come when we put our faith in Christ and not in keeping the law. I love it when uh, people summarize the concept and then go and lay in the foundation. Uh, when I was trained as a news uh, writer in, in high school and college, and I was trained to put all the information, the basic stuff, right in the first paragraph. Who, what, when, where, why, how. And these days, it's like five paragraphs later, I get to the actual point they're trying to make. I'm like, I don't need the whole story first. Get to the point first, then build the case. He does a great job here. So his conclusion, and mine too, is this. God's wonderful declaration that we are righteous in his eyes can only come when we put our faith in Christ, not by anything I can do. All right, we're going to hop over to chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 4. We'll start with that. So here's a little bit of the logic. Did you think the Bible was logical? It is, very much so. Okay. When people work, they earn wages. All right? That's what it says right there. When people work, they earn wages. It can't be considered a free gift because they earned it. Right? I mean, have you ever gone to your boss and says, I would like to have a gift of money, please, and, you know, please, would you just give He's like, you got a paycheck. <laughs> You earned it. I'm not, I can't give you a gift. You earned it. This is me owing you. In fact, by the way, God says in another verse that uh, he does not have any debts. And if you earned anything from him, that makes him a debtor. And that is not him. He will never owe anybody anything. All right. So uh, when people work, they earn wages. It can't be considered a free gift because they earned it. No one earns God's righteousness. Okay, let's just let that sink in. No one earns righteousness. Wow, that's amazing. It can only be transferred when we no longer rely on our own works, but believe in the one who powerfully declares the ungodly to be righteous. I think it might be in another verse here, but the, the, the one about being transferred here reminds me. There's another scripture that refers to your Oh, it does say account. Okay, well, it is faith that transfers God's righteousness into your, your account. So right here, this is the right spot for this little story. So if you go call up your banker, you know, you're, you're, you're an online person, pretty hip and modern, and uh, you tell him, her, can you please transfer money from this account to my account? And they say, why? And you say, because I earned it. I, it's, and he says, nope, I can't do it. What do you mean you can't do it? Says, there's only one way that money can be transferred. That's if you don't earn it. <laughs> it's opposite of what we expect, right? The only way God's blessings can be poured into our life is if we act, is if we receive this idea that we don't have, can't earn it. All right, so I think that was also, was that about verse 5 also, or was that just, uh, that was 5 also. Yep, good. All right, let's go to verse 14. Scrolling. Well, four, doop, there's 13. All right, verse 14 says, For if keeping the law earns the inheritance, then faith is robbed of its power, and the promise becomes useless. Wow. If keeping the law earns the inheritance, this inheritance is Way deeper than just righteousness. And I hate to say just righteousness because that's a huge thing. We'll get into it a little bit later. But we are heirs of all that Christ has. And he is inheriting all that comes from the Father. We are co-heirs with him. So that's a huge statement. Um, let's see if I read all of it here. So when we don't operate in faith in this matter, we rob power and promise and make it useless. Do you want to make a promise of God useless? Try and earn it. Try and deserve it. Instead, we activate it by faith in Him. We're going to just uh, jump to another chapter now. We're going to chapter 5. Some of these chapters I'll just be having one or two verses and other chapters we'll be landing on for a while. Alright, 5 verse 1. 
see. We, and two, we'll do five, one and, and five, two. Our faith in Jesus transfers God's righteousness to us, and he now declares us flawless in his eyes. Again, see that word transfer? Remember the bank analogy? He is actually making a deposit into us. And then it says, he declares us flawless. How many feel flawless? Anyone feel flawless here? <laughs> okay, there's one or two. <laughs> but no, oftentimes we, most of us feel like we have flaws. But our feelings, as much as they're a real experience, they are not the actual truth. There's a difference between what I'm experiencing and actual truth. So God declares me flawless. He looks at me and says, finished. That's amazing. And by the way, I'll throw this in. Um, I believe part of this is the concept of time. So God is not from the past, in the present, and knows the future. He's not even in the future. He's not even in the past. He actually is in all of it at once. In fact, he's not even in time, to be really thorough here. He actually, so look, think of, a, of, a, of a, man, a car, what do you call it, assembly line at, a, at Ford or Chrysler or some car plant place. When you see that car, well, you see that frame and four wheels and a couple of seats in it with nothing else, do you think that thing is flawless? Perfect. No. Well, God sees it running off the end of the line. He sees it finished. And he doesn't look at the past and the middle and all that stuff in between as if that's going to stay that way. He knows that you get to this place of being perfect, and so he sees you that way right now, right this moment. He sees you that way. All right, a little uh, helpful analogy, hopefully. Let's see, that was uh, verse 1, verse 2. Um, well, let's just look up here. Our faith guarantees us permanent access into this marvelous kindness that he has he has given us a perfect relationship with God. Well, let's just stop at that part there. Let's see if I can find it in my own thing here. Why? There's one. Boy, I thought it. Usually I, I have to wait for the stuff. Oh, there it is. Okay. Our faith guarantees us permanent access into his, this marvelous kindness that has given us perfect relationship with God. All right. You want a perfect relationship with God? It's in the area of righteousness that has to be the foundation. You must grow and learn and develop in this area of receiving his righteousness if you want to have a perfect relationship with Father. His, and by the way, he says he's, a, he's kind. Did you catch that? His marvelous kindness. But look at this. You know what the result is? Connected to this topic of righteousness is this. What incredible joy bursts forth from within us as we keep on celebrating our hope of experiencing God's glory. Joy, incredible joy, bursts forth. If you want more joy in your life, this is the topic right here. This, there's a scripture in Second uh, Peter also that talks about all these characteristics that you should grow in. You have to add to this, this, and add to another thing, the other. And it says, and if you fall short of those things, it means that you are short-sighted and have forgotten that you've been cleansed from all your sins. Spells it out right there. All right? That's outside of Romans, so I shouldn't go into that too much because I could spend hours talking about this stuff. So there is a fly or a something up here that just likes me. All right, I have an. I hope that's not a mosquito because I have not been bitten by a mosquito in 13 years, and I better not happen today. <laughs> so I don't know what it is. Yeah, even in Minnesota, I haven't been bitten. So that being said, uh, let's see. That's verse two. Let's go to verse nine. All right, there we go. And there is still much more to say on His unfailing love for us. There's much more to say. I mean, we've spent hours now, two and a half or so hours with the two sessions, all the previous sessions, talking about this, and now it says there's more. And there's still much more to say of his unfailing love for us. For through the blood of Jesus, we have heard, we have heard the powerful declaration. Okay. I'm going to be prophetic right now. I'm going to speak the word of God about you. Here's a word for you. Thus saith the Lord, 
You are now righteous in my sight. You are now righteous in my sight. You are now righteous in my sight. Thus saith the Lord. Oof, I mean, little zips all over the I'm just saying that. That's his word talking to us. You want a prophetic word? Boom. That's it right there. You are now righteous in my sight. And because of the sacrifice of Jesus, you will never experience the wrath of God. Never experience the wrath of God. Whoa. Because of what? The righteousness of God. Oh, man. I, could, I gotta move on because there's so many great things here. Oh, yeah, verse 10. We're going to do 10 and 11 here. Uh, 10. So if while we were still enemies, God fully reconciled us to himself through the death of his son, then something greater than friendship is ours. By the way, uh, anyone else willing to admit that that song from 10, 15 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, I'm a friend of God, it just never sat right with me. I don't know why. It seemed like a nice song, but... I kept thinking, oh, is this something not right about that? Well, this says that we have more, something greater than friendship with God. I mean, it's okay to say you're a friend of God. That's not a problem. But maybe it was just that it was an earworm, and I couldn't get it out of my head for days. And so uh, I won't even go into the tune right now, because that'll really bother me <laughs> for another few days. But uh, something greater than friendship is ours. And now that we are at peace, oh, wait, it says now that we are at peace with God. It's almost like it's just passing it by real fast. We're in this righteousness from Jesus. We are at peace with God. Who wants his peace? Who wants to be at peace with the God of the entire universe? Man, if someone, if someone's going to be, if you want to, if, so, if, if there's a person to be on your bad side that should never, never be on your bad side, it's God, okay? I mean, everyone else pales in comparison to uh, him being on your bad side. Well, this says we have peace with him. And I add on to that, we also get his peace, which is amazingly powerful. So it's not just that we're at peace on paper or legally speaking, but he gives us his peace. I'm still filling that skeeter or whatever that thing is up there. All right, verse uh, 10. Let's see here. I might have already gotten into it. So if we're still, oh yeah, if, if we're still enemies, oh, I was in it, okay. Um, let's go to 11. And even more than that, okay, so how many times can you build on more than this and much more than that? In addition to this, well, here he says, and even more, we overflow with triumphant joy. So here's something that blocks joy. Guess what it is? Self-effort, self-merit, trying to live up to a standard yourself. That blocks joy. So if you want cascading joy, you want overflowing joy, if you want, oh, and look at this. It says triumphant joy. I got to put this tablet down for this one. Okay, triumphant joy means you had a victory. It's a touchdown dance. Like, yes! Oh, yeah! Victory! It's a victorious joy. We have that place to be victorious over things. And I got to mention Victory doesn't come without effort, in a way. So if you just crush an ant with your foot, do you celebrate victory? That mm -hmm. eh, was nothing. No. But what Jesus says, in this world you will have trials and tribulations, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Guess who lives in me? Guess what it says here? I can experience triumphant joy overcoming the world. Big picture. Can't go into it right now what the world is. You guys probably already know, all right? That was verse 11. Let's move to verse 17. I hope you guys are getting some life out of this because there's a lot of life in this. In Romans. Romans is like a legal document. And it's like, have you ever read your mortgage paperwork? <laughs> it's all 80 pages. Uh, it kind of almost feels that way, but not when you look at it from a perspective of life. All right, verse 17. Yep, make sure it's the one next one. Death once held, its, held us in its grip. 
by the oh yeah, okay, this will be an interesting uh, little phase here. 18, 17, 18, and 19. So death once held us in its grip, and by the blunder of one man, death reigned as king over humanity. But now, how much more are we held in, in the grip of grace and continue reigning as kings? Okay, we talk about that, right? Reigning as kings? We talk about that. Well, here's the, here's the, the foundation to it all. Righteousness of God. That's the foundation of it. So you want to reign as a king or queen? Uh, it's about righteousness. All right, so, uh, so we, as we held, we are we are well, held in the grip of grace and continue reigning as we are held, okay? Enjoying our regal freedom through the gift of perfect righteousness in the one and only Jesus Messiah. Verse 18. In other words... Just as condemnation came upon all people through one transgression, so through one righteous act of Jesus' sacrifice, the perfect righteousness that makes us right with God and leads us to a victorious life. Whew, sometimes Paul has uh, no does not breathe <laughs> when he writes. <gasps> okay, uh, is now available. Oh, I could have just finished it that one there. Um, that's a long sentence. In other words, just as condemnation came upon all people through one transgression. So through one righteous act of Jesus' sacrifice, the perfect righteousness that makes us right with God and leads us into victorious life is now available to all. Let's just read through the next verse. One man's disobedience opened the door for all humanity to become sinners. That's Adam. In case you're not sure about that one, that's Adam. So also one man's obedience opened the door for many to be made perfectly right with God and acceptable to him. Now here's where I, I don't know if this is going to be a drop in a bomb for you guys or not. Some people might be. It might be just a little firecracker. According to these three verses and other scripture that I won't take time to get into, the reason why someone goes to hell is not their own sinful behaviors. It says it right here. By one man's sin, all have been condemned. Another version of the translation says, by one man's sin, all have been condemned. Why do we try and build up this, I'm a sinner and I'm so horrible and I did something in his blog. <laughs> one person's sin, not yours. Now, are you off the hook? There's two types of sin. I know, there's, there's a friend of ours who's actually in heaven now. I'm sure he's arguing with me right now about this. But, um, well, he's actually going to be correct because he's in heaven. But um, the, the two types of sin I'm going to refer to is one is a verb and one's a noun. All right? The verb sin is your behavior. And there is a difference. And I don't actually have all the Greek knowledge to look that stuff up. But check out Creflo Dollar on this topic about sin. Um, so the verb sin is behavior. The noun sin is a condition or your identity. When Adam sinned, he sold all of mankind into a condition of sin. He legally gave his bloodline over to the enemy. Now with Yeshua, Jesus, you're in a new bloodline. So you are no longer under that power. But just so you know, the reason why people go to hell is not because they themselves did the thing that was so bad that God says go to hell. Sorry, Mom. Don't use that. <laughs> I used that phrase one time, and my mom emailed me and said, uh, you don't have to use street language. Love, Mom. <laughs> Anyways, um, that was funny for me. Uh, so let's move on. That's not necessarily critical in the area of, of righteousness, at least for now. I mean, that's a relevant topic. But we're going to go to another chapter, I believe. Let's see. Yep. We're going to land on cha uh, chapter 6, verse 14, just for one verse. Oops. There we go. 14. I know, I know Emily's already got this up there, but... I'm trying to face you guys some more instead of having myself turned uh, toward my back or my left, my quarter of panel or whatever they call that hindquarter to you. Um, remember this. 
And so when you're writing God's word, you're being, when the Holy Spirit's right, telling you to say this, remember this. That's God saying, remember this. Sin will not conquer you. For God already has conquered sin. You are not governed by law, but governed by the reign of the grace of God. Well, let me, you know, there's another version here. I'm just going to, here's what it says. There's another version that says it a little bit uh, more in the area I want to make, I want to highlight. Following the law places you under sin's dominion and control. Oh my goodness. You thought you were trying to get away from sin by following the law, by obeying the law, by obeying your code, your, your whatever formula you think it takes to get to be in right standing with God. But it actually puts you in sin's dominion. We don't want that. All right, let's go to uh, chapter 8, verse 7. All right, verse 7. In fact, the mindset focused on the flesh fights God's plan and refuses to submit to his direction because it can't. Now, here's an interesting phrase. I have used this all my life and didn't quite get it until I started to really study this. It's called walking by the flesh. You've heard that phrase? Walking by the flesh. Do you know that the context in this part of Scripture is, it, is the law? Walking by the flesh is associated with trying to follow the law. It's, there's other ways to describe walking by the flesh, but in this context, that's what it's referring to. So keep that in mind. That was just that one verse, right? Yeah, so let's see. Read it in this one. The mindset focused on the flesh fights God's plan. Are you fighting God's plan? Yeah? Are you fighting God's plan? Don't fight God's plan. <laughs> you'll lose. I promise you. Not only will you lose, but you'll lose out. There are so many blessings by, by uh, what's the term I'm looking, thinking about? Well, that's not uh, to, there's a term for submit and just let, it, let God have his way. Um, there's so many benefits from that. We've talked about joy. We've talked about peace. We've talked about it. We'll talk in the few minute here about intimacy with him. We'll talk about his declarations of us as being perfect and amazing. All right, let's move to the chapter. Oh, we are in eight. We got a few of them in eight here. So also verse eight of that chapter. For no matter how hard they try, God finds no pleasure with those who are controlled by the flesh. Okay, so if you want to please God? Anybody? Yeah? Yeah? Don't do it by the flesh. Don't do it by trying to earn it. There's no way you can please him if you do it that way. Let's go to verse 13. For when you live controlled by the flesh... You are about to die. Well, let's just not go into that right now because actually I haven't dug into that term die here, but it doesn't sound good. I can promise you that much, okay? Um, you're about to die. But if the life of the Spirit puts to death the corrupt ways of the flesh, we then taste his abundant life. Did not Jesus say he came to give us life and life abundantly? Okay, so there's a connection, right? God's desire is for you to have abundant life. And if you are trying to fix your behaviors with your own efforts, with your own willpower, you actually are, are doing it according to the flesh. There is, it's, it's an oxymoron. It's kind of contradictory here. But, but if you try to, so let's just say willpower, willpower your way not to do a certain thing that you th see as sinful. The act of using your willpower is a sin. You haven't actually changed the source of that behavior. The source is actually your own beliefs. It's in your heart. Romans 12.1 says, the transformation of your mind. That's how we change these areas of our life that are, are we feel like we just failed at and failed at and can't seem to get under control or get, get into the right way. We have to change our thinking to do that. We can have some great experiences but they don't actually produce long-term change if the belief system is still in the heart. All behavior, those are the counselor talking, okay? All behavior 
is a symptom of what you believe. So stop trying to change the symptom. Let's go for the real root. It's the belief structures in your heart. All right. That was four. Oh, yeah, 14. 14 is the next one. Oh, another reference to mature children. I started tonight with that. The mature children of God are those who are moved by the impulses of the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's a really good one. Um, and they are also in other, other verse, virgin, versions or translations that refers to the sons of God. Those who are led by the Spirit, they're the sons of God. Okay, so we want to be led by the Spirit, not by the law. Let's go to, oh, we have one more here, 17 in the same chapter. And since we are his true children, we qualify to share. Oh, my goodness. Oh, man. And since we are his true children, we qualify to share all his treasures. How many treasures does Jesus have? We will spend eternity discovering them, and we get to share in those things. If you're his true child... Who are the true children of God? Those who will walk by the Spirit. And then it says, For indeed, we are heirs of God himself. Heirs. Doesn't say partial. Doesn't say smidgen. <laughs> doesn't say a little speck of dust, a little pinch of salt, you know, and you're cooking a little pinch of salt. That we are full heirs of God himself. And since we are joined to Christ, we also inherit all that he is. Oh, 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 here we go. Catch this. We inherit all that he is and has. So I used to think we inherit all that he has. But it doesn't say that there. It says, well, it has that in it, but it says all that he is. I think I could spend the rest of my life chewing on that one. It almost feels sacrilegious to think that I will inherit all that he is. I, and I won't go there any, at the moment. I mean, I'm going to chew on this, but you chew on it too. You chew on it. What does that mean? Those who are called the sons of God, those who are walking in righteousness by a God, not of ourselves, they are, uh, we will inherit all that he is. That's just a, Mind-blowing. All right. So we're going to sum all this up in chapter 10, verse 4. All right, this is it. We're, we're done with Romans. We're going to go for a little bit of review after this, but this is, this is the, the 20 year or so that I figured we better focus on tonight. Well... For the Christ is the end of the law. And because of him, God has transferred his perfect righteousness to all who believe. You, your bank account is full. The one that you don't deserve. <laughs> the one that you don't list as you have merit, have reasons for it. The one that is truly given to you by grace through faith. That one is full. transferred his perfect righteousness to all who believe. Wow. I am so, he is so fired up about that. Again, this is just one piece of this huge pie. Uh, I, there are literally hundreds of verses that we could pull in on this. I know that for sure I've got 200, and then I'm realizing as I expanded the topic to be more on the life-giving side of righteousness, not just the law versus grace, I realize there's hundreds more. But let's summarize what we did the first and second weeks, and then today, uh, definitely my readers for this print. Now here I'm just going to be reading through them. I'm not going to wait, you know, put them up on the, the screen. Galatians 3.3, 3. being saved by the Spirit, we cannot perfect ourselves in the flesh. Does that sound familiar? I think I've said that today even, right? But that's in another book of the Bible. Also verse 3 says, trying to perfect ourselves through the law is foolish. Anybody feel like they're pretty smart? <laughs> Don't be foolish. Don't try and perfect yourself through the law. 
Verse 5, receiving the Spirit and powerful works is not by doing the law, but by faith. Did you get that? Powerful works come through faith, not being an obedient to this law. The fact the law, it says in other parts of Scripture, is passing and changed. I'll get that to you in a minute. Or two. All right, verse 10. Oh, man. Galatians 3.10. Those doing the works of the law are under a curse. Do you see the logic here? Don't be foolish. Don't choose to be under a curse. Don't follow the law. Let the Spirit lead you. and Let righteousness by faith be your foundation. If we follow the law... But don't do all the law, all of the law, then we are under a curse. That's also part of verse 10. Verse nine, uh, three, ch uh, chapter 3, verse 19, the, the Levitical law, Torah in this case, was added until the seed came, which is Christ. Okay, let's just hit that for a moment. Some people believe that the, there's the, some of the law, some of the law is pertinent today, is relevant today to follow. It says here it was written until the seed came. Is in effect until the seed came. Has the seed come? Yes, Jesus. So that law is no longer in effect. It'd be like um, you uh, going before the judge after a speeding ticket and saying, "Hey, I was I wasn't breaking the law. I I was going sixty five miles an hour." And he says, "Well, the law changed. It's fifty five, like a year ago. Did you not see the signs? Yeah, but it used to be sixty five. It's not anymore. You broke the law. <laughs> so, so don't try and fight for something that has already ended. All right, chapter 5, verse 4. Oh, oh, man, it hurts to read this, guys. In a way, I'm pretty excited. Being justified by the law deprives you from all benefits of Christ. Not some, all. What did I say earlier? How much does all mean? All means all. <laughs> okay? Uh, it does not say some. Oh, and there's no asterisk here that says, oh, of course, you know, of course unless you're following 600. Uh, no. Um, being justified by the law deprives you from all benefits of Christ. Now, here's another funny one. It's kind of a slap in the, in the, uh, into the televangelists of the 80s. Those trying to be justified by the law have fallen from grace. You know, there's a, a there's there's some televangelists and other famous people that they you know the media reports them as so and so fell from grace. Well, honestly, one of them I know for sure actually fell into grace. He was not living in grace before then, and now he actually is. So um, we're actually falling from grace is not about to, having a behavior of sin. It's actually not trusting in Jesus for his righteousness. That's falling from grace. Last verse in Galatians, trying to be justified by the law means you are not obeying the truth. I, I, I don't have a hammer here, but I kind of feel like I do. It's like, boom, boom, boom. Sorry, folks, I don't mean to, well, I do mean to hammer it, because it's so important. If you're driving off a cliff, I'm going to hammer that you're driving off a cliff. I'm going to be telling you, stop, turn, don't go there, you're, there's a cliff. I'm going to hit it hard, okay? Well, fortunately, I don't have to. Because scripture does. Okay, into Hebrews. We're going to move uh, quickly through this. Hebrews 4.11. The way it says in the Passion, as a quick summary here, the bullet point is, make sure to enter into this rest from works to avoid falling into unbelief. And actually what it says in other uh, translations, strive to enter into his rest. Strive. When do you ever have the word strive and rest meaning the same thing, right? No, put it on a top priority. Top priority. And look what happens if you don't. To avoid falling into unbelief. Unbelief comes on you because you haven't moved your heart to rest. You haven't tried to enter into his rest. Not your own fake rest when you look at your bank account and say, I got enough money. No, not that kind of rest. I mean the rest where the bank account is, is father. He's got the entire universe. 
He doesn't just have a, a cattle on a thousand hills. He's got a hundred trillion hills with cattle on them, okay? His bank account's bigger. That's when we trust that. But um, make sure to enter into his rest to prevent falling into unbelief. Verse six, uh, 16, chapter 4, verse 16. God encourages us to boldly come to him because of his grace. Now here's God saying, come, come to me, please. Don't try and deserve it because here's what the actual verse says. That we can boldly approach the throne of grace in our time of need. When are we in a time of need? When we've been having sinful behaviors. So if you think you get to clean yourself up before you can come to God, you've got that whole thing wrong. You get, you're in a bad, uh, crazy cycle loop here. Because you can't get yourself cleaned up right enough to be before God to get the thing that you need to be cleaned up. It's just like Jesus says in, that uh, you must, in order to bear fruit, you must be uh, tied into the vine, or abiding in the vine. And we are like, well, i got to produce some fruit before I abide in the vine. No, the abiding in the vine produces the fruit. Not the fruit produces the abiding. We've got to get this right. All right, chapter 6, verse 1 of Hebrews. Oh, I already read this at the beginning. Repentance from dead works, faith towards uh, in God is foundational. I'll just hit stop on that or uh, move along. Verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 12 of Hebrews. So it says, with the priesthood changing, the law is required to change also. So this is a big part of what's going on here. There used to be the Levitical priesthood through the lineage of Aaron. He was the first one. Jesus is not of that priesthood. He's, a, he's the high priest of the order of Melchizedek. And I'm not going to get into Melchizedek today, but it says the law must change. New rules. The old has passed. The new has come. All right? These are summaries, so I can't preach on this. <laughs> so, all right. Oh, and verse 19 of chapter 7. Levitical law made nothing perfect. New covenant is how we approach God. I'll go to chapter 9, verse 14. Jesus' blood purges us from the dead works of the old covenant so we can worship. Wow, the language here isn't all that favorable towards those following the law. It says... Jesus' blood purchases us from dead works. Well, that's, I guess it says dead works. That is what dead works are, is trying to follow the law, all right? Um, so that we can worship. Our worship is affected by this. You want to have greater worship with God? Let him purge you of dead works. That's where the worship comes even stronger than you've experienced it. You thought it was great now? Wait till that happens. That's going to be amazing. Uh, chapter 10, verse 19. Therefore we can boldly enter the Holy of Holies by the blood of Jesus. Oh my goodness. Holy of Holies. We're not just on the outer courts or the inner court. We're in the Holy of Holies. We have absolute intimacy with God because of His righteousness imputed declared over us, received by us by faith. Verse 20, this grace is a new life-giving way to approach God. This is life-giving, let me assure you. This living in this kind of righteousness is life-giving. It fills you up. Jesus said at the woman at the well, to the woman at the well, the water I give you, you will never thirst anymore. It's life-giving. It fills you. Last, in, last verse in Hebrews is chapter 10, verse 22. Again, we can now confidently approach God. Our hearts are washed pure. I mean, we are, there's that hammer again. Boom, boom. It's so amazing what's here. All on the topic of righteousness. Now let me do a quick summary of Romans, which we just did. A righteousness of God has been revealed apart from the law. That was, I won't mention the verses here right now. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Access to God, perfect relationship with God, and joy. Yeah, sorry, sorry, my, uh, my tablet was talking to me. It's having trouble connecting to the internet. That's, that's fine. 
<laughs> so, okay, interrupted me there. All right, so not only do we have peace with God, but we have access to God. We have perfect relationship with God, and joy cascades over us, and do you want know, you know more? Isn't that enough? <laughs> no, we have triumphant joy, touchdown. Man, we just knocked it. Oh, there's also metaphors. I just crossed sports there. Knocked it out of the park and touchdown are different sports. But uh, And one last thing here. Well, not quite, but harmony with God. If you're not feeling like you have harmony with God, that's the topic right here. This is it. I want to encourage you guys, by the way, if you've not watched the first two sessions, get to the Oasis website on Facebook or YouTube and watch them. They're amazingly, I mean, detailed, good stuff here. All right. Sorry for the commercial. Um, it's not. It's just I want you to know this message. Okay, two more things. Abundant life comes from putting to death mortal deeds by the Spirit, not by the flesh. And the last one was that last verse in Romans we read. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness only for those who believe. So now, what do we do with all this? I mean, I can't leave you with... I can't leave you just going, all right, see you later. Have fun. Great message. High five. I want, to, I want to help you with a little bit of application here. So, you have to ask yourself a question. Do I need or do I want more victory, joy, fruit of the Spirit, power, intimacy with God, peace, Abundant life? You need more? <laughs> I could give you more. There's a lot more. Do you want to need that? Is your heart open to it? Are you willing to stop fighting against God? That's actually how he said it in Scripture. Just We read that earlier. So here's a couple, here's a, a way that you can help. There's other ways to do this. I'm gonna, I call this, you, a lot of you have heard me say this phrase, but it's, it's DWDD, do what David did. All right, David acted this way in the Psalms, and he was called a man after God's own heart. The first thing is you want to validate how you are experiencing this. It doesn't mean you're declaring it's true. It means you're saying, I'm feeling this way. David said, I feel abandoned by you, God. I feel like this and that. My enemies are this and that. And, and uh, your words and your prophecies, are they coming true? I don't know. So he talked like that. He validated that he was having his human soul experience because, you know, if there's a little lawyer inside of our hearts, that if you don't do that, it argues. If you try and brush off, oh, yeah, 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 no, don't, no I don't feel that way, it goes, oh, yes, you do. <laughs> and let me start telling you about it. In fact, I'm going to start screaming it. It'll start to get insistent. Are you sorrowful? Are you grieving? Are you hurt by a situation? Are you, you have to let your heart feel heard even by you. That's the funniest thing. You have to let your heart hear that you are hearing it. All right? But again, you're not saying that's truth. You're saying that's just the experience. And then we need to confess the cause. Self-righteous or wrong beliefs. We'll just use that. We'll focus in on that one area. Change your thinking or repent. You guys know that uh, repent does not mean change your behavior? It actually means change your thinking. Because behavior comes after you think, after your beliefs. Behavior is a symptom. If you're bleeding to death and it hurts, don't take aspirin. Well, you can. It'll, <laughs> you won't hurt as much, but you'll still die. All right, go to the source. So what you want to do is give up. Declare the truth according to, and I'll have an example here. Declare the truth according to God. Declare your dependence on the truth of, of God's word and the righteousness of Christ. And then, you know, on shampoo bottles, it'll say, it'll say apply, wash, rinse, repeat. <laughs> repeat. Now, the legal action happens right away when you do something in the courts of heaven, but your heart doesn't always believe it. So it says in Romans that faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. So please hear the word of God. That's my version of it. Um, but now that's pretty accurate. So repeat. And here's an example. Lord, I have been trying to 
please you. Yeah, I put in dot, dot. Oh, oh, Emily, I forgot to ask you to put up slides like this. That's okay. Um, it's okay. Um, Lord, I've been trying to, let's just say, have victory over the sin or trying to please you by my own efforts and merits. That's the validation part. I've been trying to, and that's the confession part. However, your word says that your righteousness is what I need. So now you've just turned and, and declared God's word. And then you have to be open and say, I received this, and thank you for already providing everything I need. So let's just say it's the topic of righteousness. Or feeling like God's okay with you, pleased with you. Like you can approach him, have intimacy with him. Lord, I have been trying to be good enough to deserve intimacy with you. By my own efforts, and my own merits. However, your word says that your righteousness is what I need. Your righteousness. <laughs> I receive this, and I thank you for already providing everything I need to please you and to have intimacy with you. Um, here's another example. Lord, I have wrongly believed that I'm a sinner. I, I actually put in whatever you want right there, but I'll just throw this in because I hear this way too often. I'm a sinner. We're all sinners. We're just saved by grace. Ah, uh, listen to the videos. <laughs> we are not sinners if we have been declared righteous and pure and holy and just and perfect. We're not sinners. That's a condition. Does Do I still have sin? Do I still do sin? Yes. Yes, I do. But am I sin? No. Identity is so, so important here. I am not sin. Actually, I am the righteousness of Christ. That's who I am. That's because if, if you don't believe that, you're arguing with God. I like having these readers. They're like little pointers. <laughs> That's really cool. I, I haven't seen the value of having readers. They've always been a pain for me, but now I can just flip them at you guys. No, really. If you know in uh, 2 Corinthians uh, uh, 10, 4, 5, and 6, it says that we cast down every vain imagination that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. If I say I'm a sinner, I am that. I am the vain imagination exalting myself against the knowledge of God. I'm saying I'm smarter than God. I got more knowledge about than him. And by the way, you don't want to do that because in earlier in Romans, that we haven't read, but Romans like 1 and 2, it says if you declare yourself to be wiser than God, you actually not only become a fool, but you now open yourself up to de degrading levels of depravity. No, 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 no. Don't ever act that way. And let God call the shots on this. Let God define who you are. All right, so here's the other example. Oh, yeah, I was trying to read through it. Lord, I have wrongly believed that I'm a sinner. However, your word says I am righteous according to the work of Jesus Christ. I renounce my former beliefs, and I choose to declare the truth of your word, which says, remember what I prophesied over you guys? You are righteous in my sight. That's his word to you. Thank you for providing everything I need for life and relationship with you. These are just examples. You can customize them. But I wanted to give you something to help you start to activate the process of faith and to transform your thinking because that's the area that needs to be worked on to get these results, to get these benefits. All right. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for all you've done. Wow, just amazing. Inheritance. We inherit all that you have and are. Thank you for that. Thank you for your word that teaches us and shows us this. Thank you for the power of your word. That It's not just words spoken, but you, the Holy Spirit, are going about everybody's heart right now and, and refining those beliefs to line up with you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. All right. All right. There we go. Yeah, only about five minutes after. We started about five minutes late.